Well, hi, everyone. We're going to start our time together. It's so good to see you here. Um, let's, uh, let's start our time together in worship through song. Would you please stand if you're able and let's sing together. Breathe. 
You know, Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and they are coming by the millions. We get to be a small piece of that incredible ministry you just saw on the screen, taking the love of God literally to the ends of the earth. And it all starts with you. It starts with you and an empty shoebox. You know, the shoebox is the tool that opens the door to a child's heart. If it was just a gift filled with wonderful toys given to a child in need who never had a gift before, that would be pretty amazing. But that is just the beginning. Every shoebox is delivered with the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ himself. It's shared. The gospel is always shared before a child gets a shoebox. And after the shoebox, working through the local church in the countries that they're given, um, they are invited to the greatest journey, which is a 12-lesson discipleship course where they get to learn more about God. They learn about Jesus. They learn how to share him. From the very beginning, the very first lesson they do, they are challenged with, now who are you going to go tell? Who are you going to share what you've learned? So every shoebox has been shown to affect between 7 to 10 people. So think about it. 50 shoeboxes packed here at the bridge could be touching the lives of 500 people in another country sharing God's love. Just amazing ministry. You know, last year, many of the boxes from the Chippewa Valley went to Paraguay. And I had the privilege of going to Paraguay this summer and seeing the other side. I was able to be involved with the distribution of the shoeboxes. I got to see a graduation ceremony. I got to meet one of the pastors of one of the small churches who shared his story with me. And I have hundreds of stories for another time. But what I do want to tell you from that is this ministry is every bit as effective as we think it is. Every bit as amazing as the statistics say it is. It is real, it is effective, and the need is huge. So I'd like to thank you for partnering with Operation Christmas Child. And I'd like you to stop at the table on the way out. Karen Beal will be out there. She is an amazing minister on our Chippewa Valley team, and she is very knowledgeable. So she will help you to know what can go in a shoebox, what can't. And if shoebox packing isn't your thing, there's a million other ways you could be involved in this ministry. So stop by and talk to Karen, and she can answer some of those questions for you. So I'd like to just leave you with a message from Paraguay, from the country I visited, from the national team there, and from the local churches I spoke to. They want us to pass on to you, gracias, and Dios te bendiga, which is thank you, and God bless you. Thank you for that. What an amazing opportunity we have as a church. My name is Luke Jordy, uh, and welcome. Thank you for coming in and worshiping with us uh, at the bridge today. So I'm going to go through a few announcements. Hopefully everyone uh, got a, uh, a handout or a program on the way in. Um, and the first thing I want to go through is, why are we here? What do we, why do we do what we do on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, downstairs and bridge kids? What is our mission? And so our mission is right on the front cover, and it's to help people connect with God and to uh, develop them into fully devoted followers of Christ. So that's why we do everything. We want to help people see who Jesus is and then develop them into um, fully devoted followers of Christ. Uh, in here is an insert. Um, it's, it's full of stuff that's going on in our church. I'm not going to be able to go through everything, um, but I wanted to touch on just a couple things. If you are a young adult, which... Uh, is college student up through upper 20s, 30s. Uh, there's a meal today after the service. So please, uh, put, after the second service, go uh, in the back and grab some food. It's going to be an awesome time just to connect with each other. Uh, and we want to serve you. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I might be a slightly out of that age range, but we'll see. I might snag a plate. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, second thing I want to talk about super briefly is a work day. We have this uh, beautiful church building, and there's some things that need to be done regularly. And so uh, we have a work day coming up November 16th, starting at 8 a.m. Um, so if you find yourself handy in any way, shape, or form, uh, at varying levels of capacity, we will have something for you to do. Um, so please, um, if you have any questions, shoot an email to the email that's here in the insert, um, and they will get those uh, questions answered for you. But please, show up, and we would love to put you to work. Um, and then last uh, quick announcement is about 412 Student Ministries. We have an amazing uh, event that's coming up uh, in January. It's called Districts Youth Conference. 
Um, and it's where there's thousands of youth uh, who are worshiping Jesus and wanting to know more about him. And so our youth group, 412 Student Ministries, will be going to that. And that is going to be um, January 10th through the 12th. Um, and we are currently in sign up. So if you have a student that is anywhere from sixth grade up to a senior in high school, um, please think about sending them to this conference. It is absolutely incredible. Um, if you have any questions, there's an email in there that uh, we can uh, answer any questions you have, and there's also a couple QR codes there if you need some more information um, or to sign up. All right, last thing, the communication card. We've got a communication card in each one of these programs, and whether this is your first Sunday or whether you've been coming for years, we would love it if you would take a moment just to fill this out. It's got a little bit of basic information on the front about yourself. And then on the back is a great spot to put any comments or prayer requests, um, as well as a few other boxes if you're interested in, in uh, knowing more about our church. Um, please, though, take, uh, take a moment to fill this out, and please put a prayer request on the back. We love to know how we can be praying for you, and we take these seriously and pray for these weekly. Um, so please take an opportunity to do that. All right, I think that's all I got for you. Which you guys would stand with me, I will pray for our service as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, you are so good, you're so holy, and you're so perfect. And Lord, it's so easy for my mind to wander while I'm, even while I'm singing to you, it's so easy for my mind to wander about what was happening last week or something exciting that happened this weekend, or maybe I'm looking forward uh, ahead to what I need to do tomorrow morning at work. And right now, Lord, I pray that you would just hone all of our hearts and minds onto who you are, to what you've done and what you've given us in your son, Jesus. Lord, you deserve all of our worship, all of our attention, and all of our praise. And right now, I pray that we as a church body would be fully attentive to who you are and worshiping you. Jesus, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue our time um, in worship, and let's keep focused um, this morning on, on Christ. You see, as you see, we're going to share communion later um, together in the service. And um, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Romans 6, 6 and 7 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Let's sing this. Hallelujah from the cross. For the cross.
rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I won't cast to what is true the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you cause death is just the doorway I want to take a second and congratulate our parents. You survived daylight savings time. So when the rest of the world gets an hour of sleep, extra hours, your kids just got up an hour earlier. So congratulations. Uh, with that, uh, Bridge Kids, you are dismissed. Um, so you can make your way to the back as the exodus begins. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, so if you have a copy of God's Word, uh, you can turn to Ephesians 4, or if you need a Bible, you're welcome to slip your hand in the air, and a couple of our ushers would be happy to uh, hand you one. If you don't have one at home, you're welcome to keep it uh, our gift to you. Uh, two quick things I want to cover, and then I'm going to pray. Uh, here will be the first. Coming up next Thursday, November 14th. Uh, we would like to invite anyone who's new to our Bridge family uh, over to our home for dessert. 6.30, November 14th, um, at our home. If you started the Bridge in the summer, or started the Bridge in uh, the fall, we'd love to have you. It'll be mostly an informal time. We'll talk for a couple minutes. We'll give you a chance to answer or ask some questions. Maybe we'll have answers for I'm not sure. I'm still new around here, too. But we would love to get to know you. It would help us if you'd sign up. So if you'd like to join us for that, there's a QR code uh, in the program, scan that, sign, sign up, let us know you're coming so that we know uh, how many are going to be joining us at our home that night. Uh, second part, which is really our family talk, and then I'll pray. Um, it's no secret that this week is election week, and I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to Wednesday um, <laughs> for one reason. I'm going to be done with all the spam texts and phone calls, so I'm looking forward to that. This also, it's no secret that this week could be, probably will be, the most divisive week of the year in our country. And I hope that we as Christ followers uh, can look a little different than the rest of the world. That is using this me versus them language, we get to use the word we. And we get to talk about unity this morning in Ephesians 4, um, as Paul's been talking about over and over again. But this week, today, provides an opportunity just to pray for our nation to pray for the election, and I would like to do that as we dive in this morning. But before I pray, I just want to give you one election reminder. This is my one political comment of the day. You ready for this? Okay. No matter what happens on Tuesday, Jesus is the king. Please don't forget that this week. Let's pray. Father, it is so good to gather as your church here at the bridge today. Uh, you have been so good and gracious to us, and we praise you together for your kindness, for your grace, for your mercy, and for your love for us. We have a couple specific requests for our nation, and first and foremost, we ask 
for a spiritual revival that there will be a dramatic move of your spirit all across our country, that we will see countless people turn to Christ, and that you will bring, bring revival to our nation, just like we saw in the Great Awakening centuries ago. And as we look ahead to Tuesday, uh, Election Day in our country, we ask that your will will be done in our elections that are on the local level, the state level, and the national level. May the candidates that you desire be elected into office, the candidates who will best uphold your will and your desire and your values. We pray for peace and protection for all involved in the election process, and we pray that you will work through the elections on Tuesday, regardless of their result. And as a church, as, the, as a body of believers here in Chippewa Valley, and as Christians across our country, may we display unity. May we not allow the enemy to use politics to drive a wedge between us. And Father, as we turn to your word this morning, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the movies that I've enjoyed watching is called Catch Me If You Can. It stars Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio. It's based on a true story set in the 19. 60s, where FBI agent Carl Hanratty, what a name, right, spends most of his career chasing down a professional con artist named Frank Abagnale Jr., and he is running from the law all around the country, and he becomes an expert at forging checks. So he's living on millions of millions of dollars that don't belong to him because he's stealing from banks all around the country. And throughout the, the course of uh, his career as a con artist, he pretends to be all of these things that he's not. Well, in one of the scenes of the movie, he finds himself in rural, rural Georgia, and he pretends to be an ER physician. Now, he forges a diploma from a prestigious medical university, and he applies for a job at a rural Georgia hospital, and he assumes that by applying for an overnight position at a rural hospital, he won't see any action in the ER. I see Bill Cayley in the front, one of our doctors, he's just laughing because you know that's a joke, right? Yeah, well, he somehow gets the job. I'm thankful that our hospitals today do a little better job doing background checks than then, but he's, he's laugh, uh, he gets the job, and overnight shift, right, there's this shift where this young boy comes in with a compound fracture in his leg. He's in a ba bike accident. There's blood everywhere. Frank is queasy at the sight of blood. So everyone's freaking out, and they call the doctor, 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 come. And Frank comes in and instantly turns like 50 shades of white, right? And they're like, what should we do? And he doesn't give any medical advice, and he hands the boy off to the resident, and as soon as he can get out of that hospital room, he finds his way to the nearest bathroom, and he loses his lunch, right? If you want to be an ER physician you can't just print a diploma, right? You can't just put on a white coat. You, you need the training. You need the calling. Following Jesus is far more significant than putting on the Jesus jersey and printing a Bible college diploma. We need heart transformation that leads to life transformation. And order matters. Step one is heart transformation, something that God's Spirit does in us when we receive Christ by faith, believing in Him as our Savior and our King, that heart transformation then leads to life transformation. And that's the whole book of Ephesians. Ephesians is probably the easiest book in the entire Bible to outline. It's simple. First three chapters are all orthodoxy. That's just a big Bible word that means the right belief. And we talked about what to believe, right? We talked about our calling. We talked about adoption. We, we talked about being filled by the Spirit. We've, we've covered theology. And I'm guessing some of you walked out of our messages for the last two months wondering, when are we going to get to the application? That's the back half of Ephesians. Ephesians 4 through 6 is all the right way to live. The fancy word is orthopraxy, the right practice, the right way to to live. And that's where we're going to apply the right theology. But order matters. We need to talk about heart transformation before we can get to life transformation. Or to use the analogy from our opening illustration, because we have a new heart, then we can put on the white coat. Order matters. So Paul begins 
the second half of the letter with Ephesians 4, verse 1. Follow along with me as I read. Paul says this, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Let's pause there. Urge, it's a plead. It, it really, if we were to translate it literally, we'd use the word beseech. But since I don't want to sound like Shakespeare today, I won't use that word, right? This is like an urge. It's a command. I'm begging of you. Live a life worthy of your calling. Now, the NIV doesn't quite translate this literally. They get the sense of the word, right? But this verse uses the Greek word peripateo. We've talked about that a number of times. It literally means to walk. That translate peripateo to live. Live a life worthy. Literally, this means walk worthy of your calling. In the rest of the book of Ephesians, really our text today in the entire book answers that question. What does it mean to walk worthy? How do we walk worthy? And if I had to guess, if I had to make a prediction, well, what does it mean? What does it mean to walk worthy? I would start with a long list of don'ts. If we go back 60 years and we ask some Christ followers, what does it mean to, to follow Jesus? How do we walk worthy of our calling? Well, they say, well, don't drink, don't gamble, don't smoke, don't go to movies, and certainly don't use drums in church, right? There'd be a long list of, there'd be a long list of don'ts. But is that where Paul starts? No, that's not where he starts. He starts with a list of do's, things that he wants us to put on. He gets to the list of things we shouldn't do. That's later. But he starts our text today with the list of things that we should do, things that we should put on as a family, what it means to walk worthy. So our principles this morning really answer that question. How do we walk worthy of our calling? Because we have heart transformation, now what does it mean to put on the white coat? So, We'll start with verse 2. I, I'm a little afraid that I've been a little too aggressive today trying to get through 16 verses, so buckle up, I guess, is all I have to say. <laughs> Good thing you got an extra hour of sleep. Okay. <laughs> verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Let's pause there. Just think about the list of virtues that Paul includes. Humility. This isn't a high virtue list in our country today, and it wasn't a high virtue in Paul's day. This was considered a slave-like quality. This was not a virtue that people wanted. But this is where Paul begins, reminding us that following Jesus is countercultural. It's a swim upstream, because Jesus is the one who shows us humility. Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant. Jesus is the picture of humility. Humility, it's not just thinking less of ourselves. It's thinking of ourselves less. Instead of looking in the mirror, it's looking out the window, thinking of the needs of other people continually before our own. Humility Humility is hard, isn't it? And then he continues with the word gentleness. It's the Greek word proutes. It's often translated meek or meekness in the New Testament. Meekness, it rhymes with weakness, but that's not what it means. It means power under control, using the power that God's given us, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. Humility and gentleness, and then everyone's favorite attribute, patience. In the Old Testament, this word meant long nose, an idiom for being long-tempered. Remember, this is in the context of what it means to be a church family, that when we interact together, maybe it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's in growth groups or anything in between, there's going to be things about me that might frustrate you. There's going to be things about someone in your growth group that frustrate you. This text reminds us that we're going to have a long fuse with one another. It doesn't mean that we just sweep conflict under the rug, but it means when we enter into a conflict conversation that we're going to let or push aside the emotional response of anger, that we're going to be quick and eager to forgive. And that's the next word, endurance, relational forbearance. We're going to persevere in our relationships with one another. We're not just going to be kind to the people that we like. We're going to endure relationally with one another. And then the last virtue is, is love. For Paul, this is kind of the top virtue, isn't it? Just read 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest of these is love, agape. It means affectionately seeking the greatest good for somebody else. Paul reminds us that if we don't have love, we might as well leave everything else aside. 
This sounds a little familiar to me. It sounds to me like Galatians 5. It sounds a lot like the fruit of the Spirit. So if we're going to walk worthy of our calling, that's our first principle this morning, is sow spiritual fruit. Sow spiritual fruit. One pastor astutely pointed out that the fruit of the Spirit is singular, not plural. Have you noticed that before? I would expect Galatians 5 to be the fruits of the Spirit, but it's not. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control are all attributes of one piece of fruit. Here's practically what that means. That means that I can't say, well, I can be joyful and you can be patient. No, we want all of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, not just one or two. Now, there's a good chance that you or I might be deficient in one or two aspects of the fruit, and we intentionally focus on that area, but we should not be content with the life void of patience because, well, at least I'm high in joy. At least I'm high in gentleness. Spiritual fruit grows from a healthy tree. So when we abide in Christ, when we remain in Christ, when we stay connected to the vine, then we will bear fruit. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We can't just staple fruit onto a tree. Heart transformation leads to life transformation. So if we want to sow a spiritual fruit, then we have to make sure we follow the right steps. So if you want to sow spiritual fruit, three steps. Here's the first. You need to trust in Jesus as your Savior and your King. If our lives haven't been transformed by the power of the gospel, then chapters 4 through 6 in Ephesians, they just become self-help. They just become wise advice. When we focus on growing the attribute without the heart transformation, we're just trying to staple a living apple onto a dead apple tree. It'll look good for a little while, but it won't lead to lasting fruit or lasting transformation. So if you walked in the door today and you don't yet know Christ as your Savior and your King, first, I'm so glad that you're here. And then second, I don't want you to leave today thinking, I'm going to live a more patient life. I'm going to live a more humble life. If that's what you received from the message today, you're missing the point. We need heart transformation first. You need to believe in Jesus as your Savior and your King. You need to turn away from your old way of life and follow Christ. It's the most important decision you can make. Don't leave today without knowing that you know Christ. So once we trust in Christ, if we want to sow spiritual fruit, second, we have to grow in our love for Jesus. The spiritual discipline, staying connected to Christ, praying to commune with the Father, Son, and Spirit, spending time in Scripture to know Christ, growing in our affection, our love for Jesus. And then, third, we can focus on specific fruit in our life. How can I be more patient? How can I be more humble? Or we ask an accountability partner or spouse or a friend, Where do you see deficiencies in the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Where do you see opportunities to grow? See, often we start with step three. How can I be more patient without thinking about steps one or two? Order matters. Trust Christ, grow in our affection for Christ, and then we focus on specific fruit. Well, as Paul continues, let's look at verses three through six. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Well, if we had to pick a theme word for verses 3 through 6, what would it be? One. Yeah, I would pick the word one. One of you would pick the word all, but I'll pick the word one. It's used seven times in three verses. Paul highlights our unity over, I feel like a broken record. We've said this every week because it's in just about every text we're reading. Paul highlights our unity. There's this group of Christians in Ephesus. There's these Jews and these Gentiles. They've never got along ever. And now they're combined into this one church. And instead of creating the first Gentile church and the first Jewish church, Paul says, we are one church. We're going to set aside our differences and we're going to focus on the majors, the things that matter. And that's the list. One Lord. Well, no, let's start with the first one. One body. Verse four. That's one body of Christ. Christ is the head. We're all different members, different parts of the body, but Jesus is our leader. He's our head. One spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. When we trust in Christ as our Savior and King, we're indwelled by the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who comes and takes residence in our heart. We have the same spirit. 
one hope, looking ahead to the future fulfillment of God's plan, looking to the future, one Lord. Lord is a New Testament term for Jesus. If you see Lord in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, it's referring to God the Father. You see Lord in the New Testament, it's most commonly referring to Christ. One faith, looking back to our salvation. We're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves as a gift of God. One baptism. Baptism doesn't save us, but baptism is the picture, the representation of what's happened in our heart, something that we do as a church family after we become a Christian. The same baptism. And one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all, God the Father. Do you notice how encompassing this list is? We're going all the way back to our salvation, all the way back to the cross, all the way to the future with the word hope. It's Trinitarian. We see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We need unity. So if we want to walk worthy of our calling, that's our second principle. Seek spiritual unity. Seek spiritual unity. As we seek unity, we look to these seven things to tie us together to build our foundation. Yeah, we should have fun together. Yeah, we should serve together. Yeah, I'm going to connect naturally with families in the same life stage as me, but our relationship as a church, as a family, occurs at a deeper level, at a spiritual level. Therefore, we need to seek spiritual connections with one another. It's one of the reasons that we can encourage everyone part of the Bridge family to join a growth group. Because those groups provide the context for spiritual connections, growing in our love for Jesus together, growing in our knowledge of God together, sharing our faith story, looking to the past, how God saved us, or anticipating the future outworking of God's plan, our hope. Unity begins when we connect spiritually, bonding through the list of ones that Paul provided in our passage. So second, we speak, seek spiritual unity And for the third, let's look at verses 7 through 10. Paul writes this, but there's a word of contrast. He's turning the passage a little bit on its head. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. Verse 9, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Okay, let's pause there. As Paul turns the passage on its head, he reminds us that unity does not mean uniformity. Paul wants to highlight our differences, our diversity as a body of Christ. Unity doesn't mean sameness. Part of the uniqueness of being created in God's image is that each of us are unique, and we bring a different set of gifts and abilities and backgrounds to the table. We have unity in our identity, we have unity in our value, but we have diversity in our role and our gifting. Through the flow of the passage, the grace that God has given us are spiritual gifts. Each of us has a unique spiritual gifting that's designed to serve Jesus' church. So then we get to verse 8, and Paul quotes from Psalm 68. We don't have time today, but if you went back and read all of Psalm 68, you'd realize that this is a military psalm where God, as the conquering king, defeats his enemies, ascends the mountain, meets with his people, and receives gifts like a king from his people. Paul quotes from Psalm 68, but he tweaks it just a little bit. He reinterprets it to talk about Christ being the conquering king, climbing the mountain. But instead of Jesus receiving gifts from his people, Paul changes the word. It says that Jesus gives gifts to his people. You catch that in in the quote? It's a little different than Psalm 68. Paul reinterprets it for uh, his own purposes here in Ephesians 4. So instead of Jesus receiving gifts, he's now the one that gets to give gifts. And then verse 9 attracts probably the most debate from scholars, um, leads to a a question, did Jesus descend to the lower regions, which is the earth, talking about his incarnation when he became man and dwelt among us, or did Jesus descend to the lower regions of the earth, referencing the time between Jesus' death and his resurrection, descending into Hades or Sheol? If that question really interests you, I would love to talk later. 
But for the sake of time, and honestly, for the sake of the flow of our passage, the answer doesn't really make much of a difference. Here's the point. Jesus descended very low. He humbled himself. He became man, dwelled among us. And then through Jesus' glorious resurrection, his ascension, Jesus ascended very high, far above all things, in order that he would fill the whole universe. Jesus is king. And because Jesus is king, he gets to give gifts to his people. He decides who gets what gift. As one of my friends reminded me as I was preparing this message, Jesus is building a spiritual kingdom. His kingdom is not of this world, as he told Pontius Pilate. So we would expect that Jesus gives spiritual gifts to build his spiritual kingdom. So if we combine this text with the other texts in the New Testament about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Timothy 4, 1 Peter 4, every believer receives at least one spiritual gift for the building up of the body of Christ, the church. That word's important, isn't it? Church. Don't forget how we define church. In the context of spiritual gifts, when church becomes an institution, when church is an organization, then our spiritual gifts build up the institution. They make the organization better. When church becomes a building, 1210 East Claremont, then I can only use my gift at church. When church becomes Sam's Club, then I want to make sure everyone else is using their gifts so they can serve me and my family. But when church is a community transformed by a common identity, then our gifts are designed to serve one another. Have you thought about this before? Who's the recipient of your spiritual gift? Who's the recipient of my gift? It's not me. You are the recipient of my spiritual gift. I'm the recipient of your spiritual gift. We need one another. Our gifts are not given for us to use in the closet. Our gifts are given to be enjoyed by one another, to nourish and to support and encourage and build up one another. So if I'm not using the gift that God's given me, who suffers? It's you. The gift isn't for me. So that's our, our third principle this morning. How do we walk worthy? Third, we share spiritual gifts. Share spiritual gifts. I want you to imagine that the Christian life was a game of basketball. And don't worry, you don't even need to be a basketball fan to understand this illustration. Many Christ followers view themselves as fans. They buy tickets to the game, they bring a sign, and they cheer loud as those who are in vocational ministry are playing the game. The teachers, the pastors, the missionaries, the church leaders, the ones doing vocational ministry, they're on the court. That is not Ephesians 4. Now, there are people in the stands, but Hebrews 12 tells us that the people in the stands are our great cloud of witnesses, the saints who've gone before us, who are cheering us on as we run the race of faith. But instead, we are all on the court together. That's Ephesians 4. We're all playing the same game. And that's what Paul gets at as he continues. Let's read verses 11 to 13 together. Again, Jesus is giving gifts to his people. So verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This passage does not provide the vocational volunteer divide that many have created in our cultural context. Instead, we all have a work of ministry. And for those of us that have a gift like pastoring or teaching, my job is not just to teach, but my job is to help you discover your spiritual gift, develop your spiritual gift, and use your spiritual gift. One of the best parts of my role here at the bridge is I get to help equip you for the work of ministry that God has prepared for you. Because the goal of spiritual gifts is clear, to build up the body of Christ. If you know Jesus, you have one. 
you have a spiritual gift. Some gifts are designed internally to serve the church. That might be something like encouragement or teaching. Some roles are designed to be external, like evangelism or church planting, building up the body of Christ from the outside. Some are both, wisdom or hospitality. But Scripture is clear. If you know Christ, you have a spiritual gift. Now, if I had to guess, some of you are getting nervous. You never thought about this before. You don't know what your gift is. Or you might have an idea what your gift is, but you haven't been using it. So how do you discover your gift? How do you use it? Well, have a couple ideas if you're unsure of what your gift might be. How do you find it out? First, read through those passages. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Timothy 4, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Read the passages about spiritual gifts in Scripture and then pray. Very simple prayer. Ask Jesus what gift he gave you. I believe that if Jesus has given you a gift to serve his church, then he is not going to make you go on an impossible scavenger hunt to find out what it is. So after you read the passage and pray, then ask a spouse or a close friend, someone who's spiritually mature, what gift do you think that I have? Then I talk with a church leader. I would love to connect with you about your spiritual gift. And finally, I would love to have you join for Discover the Bridge next semester. If you haven't done Discover the Bridge, one of the things that we spend time doing in that growth group is talking about what our spiritual gifts might be. Just four ideas on how you might discover your gift. If you know Christ, he's given you a gift. Are you using it to build up his body, which is the church? Then verse 13 gives us a picture of the finished product. As we use our gifts, as we serve one another, we grow in our unity of the faith. That's what we believe. We grow in our knowledge of the Son of God, our experiential knowledge, knowing Jesus personally in deeper ways. And third, we grow in our maturity, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, spiritual maturity is quite simple, looking like Jesus. Do I look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday? Or in the context of the passage, do we as his church look more like Jesus today than we did last week or last month or last year? Growing in maturity just means growing to look more like Jesus. And Paul goes on a bit of a tangent when he thinks about maturity. That's how our passage finishes. Let me read the last paragraph, verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect in the mature body of him who's the head, that's Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We all progress from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. It's a process that we call sanctification. That's just a big Bible word that means growing to look more like Jesus. Justification, that means declared to be righteous. That happens the moment we're saved. Justification happens in a moment. But sanctification, growing to look more like Jesus, that happens the course of our life will never be completed until we reach eternity. There's nothing wrong with being a spiritual infant when you're supposed to be one. But when someone's a spiritual infant, but they've known Christ for 10 years, that's when we run into problems. So our fourth way to walk worthy of our calling is this, sustain spiritual growth. Sustain spiritual growth. Progressing from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. A work that the Spirit does in us that we're not passive in. Paul uses an analogy of being blown and tossed by the wind. Maybe an illustration will help uh, understand what he's talking about. When I was in seventh grade, I went to a Bible camp for a week in the summer with three of my buddies, and we had a great week. It was right on a lake in northern Wisconsin, a big lake. And like a lot of camps, they had like canoes and kayaks and sailboats and those type of things that you could take out during free time. Well, my friends and I decided one day in free time we wanted to take out a canoe. Um, but this particular day was very windy, and the wind was blowing away from camp. So it didn't feel very windy when we were on shore, but once you got out onto the, the lake, then the wind picked up and you know where this is going, right? That wind grabbed our canoe, flipped it sideways, and drove us to the other side of the lake. 
And this might surprise you by looking at me today uh, because I clearly spend three or four hours a day lifting in the gym, right? But when I was in seventh grade, I was probably 70 pounds with biceps the size of a twig. So, and my friends were not any bigger. So we were no match for the wind. We were driven all the way to the other side of the lake. And then my buddy in the middle of the canoe, who doesn't even have a paddle, he's just dead weight, right? Decided to be a good idea to stand up. It's like yelling for help. I have no idea how we didn't capsize. So we somehow made it back in time for dinner because they sent a rescue boat out to save us. Me and my three or my two seventh grade friends were no match for the winds, right? We needed someone stronger. And that's the analogy that Paul's using here. When we're spiritual infants, we lack spiritual strength. Spiritual strength in this context would be something we call discernment. Spiritual infants lack discernment, just like an infant today lacks discernment. If I feed our four-month-old ice cream with chocolate syrup on top, would she eat it? Yeah, probably. But just about every medical professional would say, that's a terrible idea. Don't, don't do it, right? She lacks discernment on what she should and shouldn't be eating. Spiritual infants lack the same thing, which is why throughout history, even in Ephesus, nefarious spiritual teachers preyed upon young believers with cool-sounding theology that was steering them in the wrong direction. If we're young in our faith, we need somebody strong in our canoe. So if you're young spiritually, who's in your canoe? Who's, who's helping you navigate the wind and the waves of cultural theology. We need a spiritual mentor. You know, as I look across our cultural landscape, those who are older in our world are often not valued or respected. I hope that as a church family, we're countercultural in that way, that those in our church are seasoned saints who've walked with Jesus the longest. I hope that you are the ones who the rest of us are literally knocking down your door to glean your wisdom, to learn from your successes and your mistakes. If you're a young parent, you would be wise to find a seasoned empty nester who walked with, who's walked with the Lord for years, to take them out to dinner and to learn their mistakes and successes. Or if you're unmarried, you would be wise to buy coffee for somebody who's also unmarried or spent a lot of their life unmarried to learn experientially what it was like for them to walk through singleness in a church context that's often guilty of undervaluing singleness and over-glorifying marriage. We would all be wise to have that person ahead of us, that spiritual mentor that we can glean wisdom from but maybe you're mature in your faith. Now, all of us who are mature still need someone stronger who's pulling us along, but, but maybe you're not a spiritual infant anymore. The same question applies. Who's in your canoe? Who are you helping grow? Who are you helping take the next step in their walk with Christ? We need to make sure as a church family that we're helping one another grow. Well, the church, the body of Christ, is a beautiful tapestry. And here at the bridge, we span 100 years from our infants to Lila, from brand new believers. Someone pulled me aside a couple weeks ago. She celebrated her newfound faith in Christ. Praise the Lord. From that to some who've been walking with Christ for seven decades. We have incredible diversity, even in our individual spiritual gifts designed to serve Jesus' kingdom. And I hope you noticed how the passage finished. I hope you noticed the last Half of a sentence from Paul, as each part does its work. If there's one thing that pricks your heart and your mind as you leave today, it's this. What is your part? What special gift has God given to you? What work of ministry does God have prepared for you to build up the body of Christ? Let's pray. Father, how good it is to open your word and explore it together. If there's anyone here this morning that 
hasn't yet had the heart transformation that comes through the power of the gospel, may today be the day when they turn from their sin and trust in Christ as their Savior and their King. And for those of us that do know Christ, give us a picture of what it means to take that next step in our walk with Christ, to grow, to continue, to connect, to develop, and multiply as disciples and as disciple makers here at the bridge. Give us a picture of the work of ministry that you've prepared for us, to not be believers that just sit in the stands and cheer, but view ourselves as engaged in the game, doing the ministry that you've planned and prepared for us. God, you are good, and we love you, and we're so thankful to gather this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is a communion Sunday, and it's what a great connection, thinking about unity, our togetherness, our oneness, that we get to remember communion together. Sometimes we're guilty of making communion a me and Jesus moment. We talked about that last month. But communion isn't just a me and Jesus moment, it's an us and Jesus moment. This is a family meal, communion, us communing together with Christ. It's almost like together we're transported back to Gethsemane where Jesus suffered before he died or or we're transported back to Golgotha, the hill where Jesus was crucified. Together, we're remembering what Christ has done on our behalf. So because communion is a family meal, not just an individual thing, we're going to try something a little bit new this morning. Not a lot new, just a little bit new. Um, says the guy who said he'd never change anything. <laughs> that as you come to the front to receive the elements you'll notice that we don't have these little crackers anymore. We have real bread. And what I'd like you to do is when you come up, just rip a small piece off of that slice of bread. Emphasis on small, don't take the whole piece, right? Take a small piece, but it's a picture, it's a reminder of us as one family sharing the same loaf. Us as one family communing with Jesus together. So before we do that, I just want to remind us of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, where he says this, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink without, well, eat and drink um, judgment on themselves. So before we partake of the elements, it would be wise for each of us to have a moment of confession before the Lord and ask, Lord, is, what, what's going on in my heart today? Is there anything that I need to confess to you or to someone else before we remember communion together? So we'll have a song of reflection as the music starts. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come up and receive the elements. If you have a dietary restriction, we do have gluten and dairy-free bread here at the front. Just let the, uh, the people distributing the elements know that you'd like the gluten or dairy-free bread. You can grab that as well. Then you'll head back to your seat, and we'll take the elements together. So hang on to the elements once you grab both of them at front. Go back to your seat, uh, and then I'll come back up after uh, we sing the song together, and we'll partake of the elements. But let's go to the Lord in some time of confession now.
this in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, as a church family, as one body united in one faith and one hope, we remember together the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. The son of suffering, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He took the form of a servant, and now our Savior is highly exalted in order that he might fill the entire universe. Our hearts are filled with gratitude and with worship for what Jesus has done on our behalf. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we respond uh, to communion, let's stand, let's sing one final song together this morning. It's so good, I almost can't believe it, far beyond what hearts could ever dream. The God who set the galaxies in motion would descend to give his life for me. Oh, I could make plead for sinners what leads a king to pay so great a cost all my life my heart will sing the answer only the love of God singing oh how great is the love of God
it's so high to marvelous for words and I could sing a million songs about it and barely scratch the surface of the worshiping with us today and as we seek unity and connect um, to connect spiritually with each other as Sam said unity is not uniformity and we're all unique and we need one another let's just think about that this week Um, thank you for coming we'll see you next week I've seen shame